a Portland Community College mathematics telecourse. A course in arithmetic review produced at Portland Community College. Every once in a while, one reads in the newspaper about how some computer whiz had just discovered another new large prime number. It seems to be important. Just what is a prime number? A prime number is a whole number greater than one whose only factors, that is divisors, are one and itself. For instance, three. I can't divide it by anything except one and three. The same with 11 and 23. All other whole numbers are called composite numbers. Example would be six. If I not only can divide that by one and six, I can divide it by two and three. So a prime number is a number I can't divide by anything except itself and one. Prime numbers are of great importance to number theory and to computer coding. As of yet, it is not known how to predict the nth prime without going through those below it. That is, if I wanted the 1,000th prime, I'd have to find the 999 primes under it first. Great prizes are being offered by various scientific agencies if anybody can find such a rule. We don't even know if such a rule is possible. But nevertheless, prime numbers are of importance to advanced studies. And we will use them ourselves within the next few lessons. It will make many tasks a lot easier. To get ready for its use, we will be asking questions like this. Is a given number either prime or composite? It's easier to check for compositeness. If it's composite, that means some number other than 1 and this will divide into it. Well, we can tell that 2 won't, because that's not even. 3, let's use our divisibility test. 7 and 2 is 9, and 3 is 12. 3 goes into 12, so 3 will divide it. So we know that that number is composite. How about 151? Well, let's set up some possible divisors other than 1. Now, how far should I go? Well, remember our last exercise? The approximate square root of 151. 12 times 12 is 154. 13 times 13 is bigger, th bigger than this. So 12 is about as far as we have to go. If none of these divide, that's prime. See, that's why we've had the preceding lessons, and that's why the divisibility test is nice here. To check 2, we check the 1's digit. The answer is no. To check 3, we add the digits. 1 and 5 is 6, and 1 is 7. 3 won't divide that. To check 4, well, if 2 won't, 4 can't, so we can forget that. To check 5, that's not 0 or 5, so 5 won't. 6, well, 2 wouldn't, 3 wouldn't, so 6 won't. Now, 7, there's only one fast way to try 7. That's just a flat try to divide it. And we'll use a calculator. 151 divided by 7 is, see, we get a decimal, so 7 won't. Now, of course, if one has a calculator, it's almost to try the divisibility all the way through with a calculator. But let's stay with our divisibility test. 8 we won't try because 2 wouldn't, and 8 has lots of 2's in it. 9, sum is 7, 9 won't divide 7, 10 won't. 11, we have to just flat try that. And that's not too hard even to do mentally. We can see no. 12, well, 12 is 3 times 4, and they won't. 
So none of the numbers up to this maximum one that I have to try, which is the approximate square root of my number, none of them up to this will divide that. So that means that this number is a prime number. Prime numbers are of such importance that all math handbooks will contain a list of prime numbers. Here's an old handbook that's older than most of my students. And sure enough, here's two pages of factors and primes of numbers all the way to 1,000. And that's a small list. I have books that have even more than that. Have you noticed a partial list at the back of your own textbook? It's there. How does one get primes? Well, a technique used by the ancients called the Sieve of Aristophanes, who was a Greek mathematician who lived many centuries ago, was simply this. Start counting. Here I've counted all the way up through 110, but make this list as long as you want. Then hire somebody who's cheap but can count, and start with two. That's my first prime number. Now start counting, and every time you get two, one, two, cross it out. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and so on. Now you've just crossed out half your list, but you've crossed out, in fact, all the numbers divisible by two, and they're composites because they're divisible by two. Then the next number in your list must be a prime. That's three, and it is. Now start counting. One, two, three, cross out. See, six was not only divisible by two, but by three. One, two, three, and of course nine is divisible by three. One, two, three, twelve was divisible by two and three, and so on forever. And you have just crossed out all the multiples of three. Now the next number in your list that's not crossed out is five, and always the next one that's not crossed out will be a prime number. Now we would instruct our hired hand to cross out every fifth one. One, two, three, four, five, and that's ten, which is divisible by five. One, two, three, four, five, and so on forever. And we've just eliminated all the multiples of five. The next one on my list, which is seven, will have to be prime. Now we start crossing off every seventh one. Now you begin to get the idea, and also the idea this is a long, tedious job. As it turns out, to compute primes is a very complicated task, and that's why they're involved in tables. For that reason, it would be well for you to have a short list with you for some of the work coming up very soon. And here is some primes up to 109. Of course, the list is endless. But you don't need a very long list for most of the problems we will handle. At our school, we have a small three by five cards, which will have a list of primes up to about 500. Then on the other side, we have some basic formulas. It might be handy for you to make such a card that you can just carry in your pocket or use in your book as a bookmark. If primes are that important, how far must one go in order to check if a given number is prime. How about 409? Let's say we were going to try 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. Well, as it turns out, we don't have to try all those numbers. There's a real nice rule which cuts our work greatly. To check for primeness, one need only check for divisibility by other primes. Up to that prime number which is less, just less, than the approximate square root of the number. Now, this statement here that I only have to check divisibility by other primes saves me a lot of trouble because most numbers are composites, and this says we need not even try them. That rule says to check divisibility into 409, I need first only use prime numbers. All the in-between composites I need not try. And furthermore, I don't have to go on forever. I just have to go as far as that prime, which is approximately equal to the square root of 409. 
Well, if one has a calculator with a square root key, and most do, you punch in 409, punch in square root, and this says 20.22. So that says find the nearest prime number in your list less than 20. So that's 19. So that says the only numbers I need try to see if 409 is a prime, that is if I didn't have a list, if I had a list I'd just look on it, is these right here. Now let's talk calculators on this a little bit. We're going to see if 409 is divisible by any of these, which means we're going to use 409 for each one of these. Therefore, put your 409 into memory and simply say divide by 2. Well, 2 we don't have to try because we can see it's not even. 3, well, 4 and 9 is 13. 3 won't go into that. 5, that's not 0 or 1. 5, 5. So the divisibility test that we've had just a moment ago eliminates those without the calculator. Now we try 409 divided by 7. If I get decimals, it won't go in. So I eliminate that. Memory recall, there's my 409 again. Divide by 11. Decimals, it won't go in. Memory recall, 409 again. Divide by 13. Decimals, that won't go in. Memory recall, divide by 17. Decimals, that won't go in. Memory recall, my last prime number I need to try now. Divide by it. Decimals, it won't go in. So now we can add 409 to our list. It is prime. Now, see if we use all the facts we've been learning up to now along with the calculator, this is a fairly easy, fast job. Students often ask, can we use calculators instead of arithmetic? Actually, you'll end up using both, arithmetic facts and the calculator together. Let's go through this next problem very slowly together so we can use it as an excuse to formulate a clean set of rules for answering the question, given a certain number, can we determine whether it's prime or composite? So once we have been given that number, the first thing we'd probably want to do is to, is to find the approximate square root of that number. And to state this symbolically, of course, this symbol means I want to find the square root of 731. And these two wavy equal signs says I want the approximate one. Let's use the calculator. Here I'll use a slightly different calculator where we can see things a little bit easier. I want the square root, here's a square root sign, of 731, push the equal, and I want the approximate one, so I'll just take the whole number portion, which is 27. So we know the approximate square root of three, 731 is 27. Now, of course, you could do this by hand, by guessing 20, which is too low, then maybe 30, which is too high. And after three or four guessings and checking them by squaring each of these to see if it's close to that, we would finally arrive at 27. So the only difference between a calculator and by hand is a matter of time. You, the mathematician, in either case, must still know what you're doing. Once we have that number, the next thing we wish to do is list all the primes up to that square root. And see, this demands at least we have a list of the beginning primes. So in our case, we want to list all the numbers from 2 up to the nearest prime just under 27. So that would be 3, 5, 7, 
11, 13, 17, 19, 23. So we're going to actually try each of these and see if they will divide this. Our claim will be if none of these will divide this, then this is prime. Now you might say, but what if I don't have such a list as this list of primes? What would I do then? Then you would simply list every number. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, all the way up to 27. So if you know the primes, that will give you a lesser list. The next question you might ask is, are we saying there will be no divisor of this larger than this? Well, let's go up to this, and that question will answer itself. So after we've listed all the prime numbers up to the approximate square root of our given number, Next, we want to try each to see if any of them will divide into the given number. And, of course, we mean to divide evenly. And you may do the trial division into our given number by using calculator, if your teacher allows you to use it, or by hand. But the first three, two, three, and five, you can always try mentally without the calculator. In fact, it's faster without that. If you look at two, this is not an even number, so two is not a divisor. Look at three, the sum of the digits here is 11. Three won't go into 11, so that eliminates that. The end digit, the units digit, is not zero or five, so five is ruled out. So usually you can check these three almost instantly, faster by hand than with the calculator. And if you're reasonably good at whole number arithmetic, usually at the beginning is just as fast to do it by hand as it is to use a calculator. So to check to see if 7 will divide our given number, we can see that 7 goes into 7 once. And immediately, we can see it doesn't go into 31, so that rules 7 out. Checking 11, again by hand. 11 goes into here 6. We can see that 11 does not go into 71, so that rules that out. Seven hundred thirty-one. is it divisible by 13? Again by hand. Looks like it goes in about five times. Again, I can see it doesn't go into here, so 17 is ruled out, or 13 is. Trying the 17, looks like it goes in here about four times. Four seven is 28, carry the two, six, 51. If it goes in at all, looks like it's about 3. 3, 7 is 21, carry the 2, 5. Bingo, we have it. I did these by hand to, again, encourage you to not over-rely on the calculator. Very frequently, it's just as easy to do it by hand, and it's best that you do it in that case. Okay, so since we know that one of these numbers in this stream will divide into this, then that tells me the number is not prime. It's a composite number. But look what else happened. To check that this division is correct, you remember how we did that? We take this quotient times this divisor and ask, is the product equal to this dividend? And it is. So that's telling us that if this divides our given number, so will this. So by finding one of these numbers less than that approximate square root, if I find such a number by dividing by it, the division process gives me a bigger number. So the answer to our question at the beginning, is there a bigger number than this that might divide into our given number? And the answer is yes. However, these lower numbers will pull it out for us. 
So what we're saying is if none of these numbers up to that approximate square root will divide into this, then nothing else will either. Hence, it's a prime number. But if one of the lower ones will, then they will give us free, so to speak, one of the highers. So we don't have to look for these. These will give it to me in the division process. Do you see that? Because that relationship will help us see a process that's very important to our math in a few more lessons. So these three rules will make it quite easy to determine whether a given number, even a fairly large one, is prime or not. First you find the approximate square root of the given number, list all the primes up to that approximate square root, and if you don't know the primes, then simply list all the whole numbers. Then simply try each of them to see if any of them will divide into the given number evenly. And if there is such a divisor, we have a composite number. If there is no such divisor, this is prime. Simple, isn't it? It can be a fair amount of arithmetic, but the principle is simple. While we're here, Let's take a peek ahead into a future lesson where prime numbers in sequential order will be used very heavily. Let's take the number 72. That obviously is not prime because I can see immediately that 2 will go into it. Well, let's take the lowest prime number in our list, which is 2, and actually divide it into 72 and it would go 36 times, which is to say that 36 times 2 is equal to 72. That's how we checked it, isn't it? But now let's take that quotient, 36, and ask, is it also divisible by that current prime number, 2? And the answer is yes. So 2 goes into 36 18 times, which is to say that 18 times 2 is 36. Or if you want to, since 36 times 2 is 72, we could say that 18 times 2 times 2 is 72. Now let's look at our topmost quotient and ask, can I still divide it by yet another 2? The answer is yes. Now what we're saying is 9 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 72. Okay, but now we ask of the topmost quotient, can I divide this by 2? And the answer is no. So then let's jump to our next prime number and ask, will it divide into this number? And the answer is yes, and so on. 3 will still divide into that once, so you begin to realize I could take a composite number, in this case 72, start from the lowest prime, and begin to divide by only prime numbers until finally I will always arrive at 1. And of course, 1 times anything is itself. So what we have now is that 3 times 3 times 2 times 2 times 2 times that's it, is equal to 72. Let's say that, but let's say it from bottom up now. 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 is 72. Notice we have written 72 now as a product, many products, of only prime numbers. We will later call this way of writing any given number, the prime factorization of that number. Factorization, meaning I've written it as multiplication problems. Prime, meaning I've used only prime divisors. This is so important, you'll see it throughout this course, in algebra, in business math, and in many, many courses in the future. Generally, instead of writing it this way, though, we'll write this, 2 times 2 times 2, in exponent form, and this 3 times 3 in exponent form. So this is the 
prime factorization of 72 written in exponent form. Now, what that's going to allow us to do in within a dozen lessons of where you are right now is this kind of problem. What is the lowest common denominator of these three fractions? Do you recall that from your elementary school days? We're asking what's the lowest number that 4, 6, and 3 will each divide into? And we can see that that's 24. Now, we have a whole chapter coming after this is going to re review this if you had forgotten this, but I hope that you haven't. Okay, now this is fairly easy. We looked at the denominators. We're comfortable enough with numbers that we can just look at it, perhaps do something in our head that causes this realization to come out. But what if we had asked, instead of these three fractions, this? these very messy denominators. What's the lowest number that each of them will all divide into? Well, it certainly has to be bigger than 114. It may be a very long number. But think as we will, it just doesn't come to us like this one will. And most students in elementary school and high school simply didn't do this kind of problem because they couldn't. But what you're learning now about prime numbers and being able to take a number and write it in prime factored form is going to allow us in the next chapter, as a matter of fact, to make this problem be fairly simple. And it will all hinge from you being quite good through this in the next few lessons at being given a number and being able to answer the question through this kind of a routine is it a prime number or is it a composite? And that all boils down to these three simple procedural rules. So use this lesson to practice this very heavily until it's just routine to you. If it is, then the next dozen or so lessons will become fairly simple. This is your math host, Bob Fennell. We'll see you at the next lesson.